It was Christmas Day and the most bitter cold December we had known. The night before, it had been 19 below. But inside, it was cozy and the fire was crackling in the fireplace. In between nursing my newborn and setting the holiday dinner table, the phone rang. It was the hospital asking for my mother. My father had died. Three days later, I stepped into the pulpit of my childhood church, St. Francis Cabrini, and gave my father's eulogy. It was the beginning of my becoming our family eulogist. <laughs> True. And of my belief in the beautiful and powerful energy of eulogy. My father's eulogy was the first of many for me. Thereafter, I gave the eulogy for my younger brother, my mother's brother, my sister's husband, my mother, and my husband. In a matter of minutes, you know, after each of these mortuary meetings, I managed to sum up the lifetime of each of them, of Paul and Tim, of Howard and Leonard, of Sally and John. I wept at the writing, of course, of each eulogy, but not just for the grief of my own loss, but in seeing so clearly the best of who they were, the difference their lives made, and how powerful the influence of a single life, no matter how humble. Picture a funeral or a memorial service that moved you deeply? Did you learn something about the person who had died which you hadn't known before? Perhaps how she volunteered at the food bank every week or how he baked an amazing banana cream pie? Did you wish that you had spent more time with them or known them better because you saw what they might have brought to your life? Were you touched by how much they meant to others? Perhaps how beloved they were by their coworkers in that job you couldn't imagine staying in for 32 years. Hmm? When we listen to a eulogy, there is a moment in time when we are acutely aware of the best of who a person was and of just how much difference a single life can make. Hmm? In short, Eulogies inspire. You know, matter, no matter how imperfect the life, no matter how short, eulogies inspired, inspire. Now, when we listen to a eulogy, we're accustomed to hearing of the successes of a person, yes? You know, the education they achieved, the family they raised, the businesses they grew, the awards they received. In short, their goals met. Now, my brother Tim was someone who had a lot of achievements, met a lot of goals. He was handsome and hardworking, bought his first car at 16, grew more than one successful business. But when Tim died of AIDS at the age of 35, he was remembered not just for his wonderful restaurant on Peach Street or his historic home with the half dozen fireplaces. He was remembered for how he lived, without complaint without bitterness, without an iota of self-pity for how he got out of bed every day, even when his body was more like a skeleton than the muscular young man that we'd always known him to be, how he got up and went to work with a burning desire to transcend a disease which during his lifetime meant shameful stigma and certain death. Tim was remembered for the courage and the dignity and the grace with which he lived life and faced death. You know, researchers tell us that if we set and reach ambitious goals that we'll be happier in life, and I will tell you, I for one absolutely love, love, love setting and reaching goals. In fact, I love it so much, I now make my living helping people set goals. True. Yet at the end of your life, what will matter most is not so much the goals that you met, as how you were being as you reached them. Because we can so easily forget who we are. Hmm? 
You know, we live by our lists. We are exhausted from our actions. We do and we do and we do. We somehow think that if we do more, our lives will matter more. So while goals are really a very important way of demonstrating who we are, at the end of your life, yeah. if you've only engaged yourself in a lot of activity, you will not be fulfilled when that time comes. Writing my mother's eulogy presented a real paradox for me because my mother's life was everything and nothing that I wanted. My mother was 10 when the depression hit and life changed. She graduated from eighth grade and left home shortly thereafter for an easier life, cleaning and doing laundry six days a week for a $4 a week paycheck. My mother bore nine children, eight of whom lived. She continued to work low-wage jobs throughout her life. She lived most of her life on the edge of poverty and was widowed at 59. This was the nothing of my mother's life that I wanted. And the everything that I still long to be, that dedicated mother who returned to work three weeks after giving birth to her fifth child to work the night shift waiting tables because her family needed to eat. The spiritual woman who would walk miles each Sunday to attend Mass and consider that the highlight of her week. The grateful neighbor who had profound gratitude for a kind act as small as a smiling hello from across the back fence. At the end of her life, my mother's influence was measured not so much by what you and I call achievements, but by who she was being, kind loving, generous, forgiving, grateful. When I was six years old, my big sister got married, and my brother-in-law, Howard, moved into our already large and crowded household. That year, I contracted chickenpox. I was covered from head to toe in itchy red bumps. I remember lying in the dining room turned bedroom, stark, with a cool cloth covering my eyes. I opened my mouth and Howard slowly, gently, patiently fed me strawberry jello. I felt so comforted, so cared for so loved. You know, uh, today I can't remember much of what a Howard ever said to me, or I don't even think I could recite his major life achievements, but I will never forget that feeling. As Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. When Howard died 46 years later, I gave his eulogy. I could still feel that love from a single kind act nearly a half century before. The last eulogy I gave was for my husband, John. Now, because John was um, one of these people who was happy and holy and healthy and dedicated to living that way, we were stunned when he received the diagnosis of terminal prostate cancer. We had just celebrated our third wedding anniversary, and it was two weeks before our much-anticipated Alaska family vacation. The doctor encouraged us to take the trip conveying without saying, this could be your last. Because there was no recommendation for surgery or radiation or chemotherapy because it was too late for that. From that day forward, John dedicated himself to living life with the absolute awareness of the 
preciousness and the brevity of life. He prayed and he meditated and he did yoga. He gardened organically. He grew wheatgrass. He made goat yogurt. <laughs> he began his days with a ritual of Jesus, tea, and me. And more than anything, he let people know how much he loved them. John went on to become a wellness coach and guided countless other people with deadly diagnoses to lives of meaning and healing. John outlived that prognosis of death in two years by 10 years. With over a decade to contemplate his death, he lived a life of being the best of who he was. You know, hospice nurses tell us that at the end of our lives, most of us will ask the same thing. Was I loved? Did I love well? Did my life make a difference? At the end of your life, you will ask, was I really present to those that I love? Or was I more present to my phone? Did I really remember what was most important? Or did I lose sight? Did I have a heart of compassion now that I need it so badly from others? Writing your own eulogy will inspire your answers to these questions. Contemplating your eulogy brings your attention to your greatest hopes and dreams. If you knew today that you were going to die, and we all do know today that we're going to die, <laughs> you would take your bucket list more seriously. Your someday I'm gonna, and I've always wanted to, would become this year I'm going to, and now I will. But your eulogy, written now, is more than just a list of goals to be achieved. It defines who you will be as a sister, as a father, as a friend, as a coworker, as a neighbor, as a leader, as a world citizen. Now, many of us are unsure of our path in life. We wonder, what is our calling? You know, what is our purpose? Well, remember that eulogy that touched you and the clarity and beauty with which you saw that person? Writing your own eulogy will help you to have that same clarity about yourself. Your eulogy is a clear compass pointed in the direction of the life you are called to live. You know, Stephen Covey invited us all to begin with the end in mind. Writing your eulogy invites you to begin with the end of your life in mind. And as we all know, that could be at any time, because whether you're like me and you fancy yourself becoming a centenarian, or you see this as being the final season of your life. You could be killed in a car crash tomorrow, or you could die peacefully in your sleep tonight. We've all been shocked by unexpected death. None of us knows when death will come, only that it will. Imagine that your death had arrived. Envision your friends being grief-stricken and gathering to select flowers and photos and music and to share the stories of how you influenced their life. What would you long to hear them say? Write your eulogy now and decide who you are, who you're willing to be, and how you want to be remembered. Now, you might worry that you can't live up to your own eulogy. You know, this would be a normal thought. Sometimes we doubt that we have what it takes. But I promise you that you do. 
You long to hear those words be described because they are you. They are the real you. The contributions you are here to make are uniquely yours. Call forth that courage that is within you to shift from the fear that you are not enough, that you don't know enough, that you aren't sure, that you can't. Shift. Shift. <laughs> you know, shift from thinking it's too late or from comparing yourself to others to having compassion about your past, clarity about who you are, and courage about your future. You know, we can all decide what will be at the end uh, you know, what, what will be written on our tombstone at the end of our lives. Hmm? Here lies Susan. She lived her life being the best of who she was. Or, here lies Susan. She never really considered who she was. You know, it's up to us. Don't wait until it's too late to write your epitaph. Hmm? Write your eulogy now, today, before the day is over. Pick a partner and by a day, decide a day by when you will write your own eulogy. Eulogies are for the living. Write yours now. Live into it. Read it often. Begin to live the life that you are called to live. So that at the end of your life, you will have no doubt that you were loved, that you loved well, and that your life made a difference. If you harness the beautiful and powerful energy of eulogy, I know that it will. Thank you so much. <laughs>